We're going to continue our uh, study through Amos. Um, I'm very excited for this. Um, it's funny, uh, Steve and I, you, you sent me my, my picture and I didn't use it today, I'm sorry. Um, he made a graphic for me that's, uh, that looks really good, so that'll, that'll be on our opening uh, page next, uh, next week. But um, today we're going to be, we've made it to chapter 5. So uh, I've been trying to talk to the elders about, uh, we talked about this this past week on uh, our journey through Amos. Um, goal was to make sure that this did not feel as cumbersome as Acts did. So, you know, sometimes we'd have, you know, a verse that we do for like three weeks straight. And so we're trying to cover a little more territory at a time to, uh, to work our way through Amos, but also make sure we're not leaving things out. And so um, we are covering a little more uh, at a time, but I, I, I am trying to help us get the meat of it out of here. And I, I love this passage. So this is the second one that we've gotten to where we get the clearest picture of the gospel given um, that, you can, that you can find in the Old Testament, just a clear picture of what it takes to be saved, of the state and the condition we find ourselves in, and then what God offers us even in that state. And so I'm so excited to study this. So if you'll turn with me, Acts chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O, o house of Israel. Fallen, no more to rise, is the virgin of Israel, is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. So lamentation, that's a, a, a Hebrew word, kina, and it means it's a, it's a funeral song. So literally, this was a specific song that you would sing after someone had died. If you're um, uh, uh, mourning their loss, grieving over them, this would be one of the specific types of songs that you would sing after their death. So Amos is saying, I'm singing your funeral song to you. Can you imagine if we met here today and I started reading a eulogy for someone present in this room. But I just started reading it. I'm like, okay, and today we're going to celebrate the life of Wesley. And he'd be like, wait, huh? I, I'm, uh, I'm here. Uh, that, that, that's me. I, I'm not. That's what Amos is doing, right? He's singing a song that was, they, they would have known. He's saying, I'm, I'm going to sing this song. This is Lamentation. I'm singing this over the death of Israel. And I'm sure Israel would be struggling with this, right? Because they're hearing this. And again, most of this message has been hard for them. They love the first part of this letter that, that Amos got to write. They love the first part saying, hey, all these other nations are bad. And they're like, yeah, they are. And then I'm sure they loved even like the, the small part after that. Hey, Judah's struggling too. And they're like, yeah, they are. And then the rest of the book is Israel, you're really struggling. And this has been so hard. There's been so many things, so many pictures that they've gotten inside of this from, of God saying, I'm coming uh, as a warrior against you. I'm coming against you as the host of armies. I'm coming as the lion of Judah. And you should be scared of, of this lion. He says, prepare to meet your God and hear after uh, the, the passage last week where Amos warns Israel, hey, prepare to meet your God, Amos then says, I'm, gonna sing, I'm, I'm right now singing your, your funeral song. This is where we're at. He says that Israel has fallen, no more to rise. So here's a, another incredible gospel presentation, right? Israel's love of sin has created a major problem. It placed them as God's enemies. And they have no hope of winning that battle on their own because they cannot raise themselves out of their sin. So this fallen, it's almost like we're supposed to be uh, picturing this fallen in battle. Remember when uh, earlier in Amos, he talked about the bowmen who are going to just fall, right? Instead of being uh, successful and they're going to be the ones winning the, the battle, they're just going to fall on the battlefield. These are soldiers in a fight against somebody they cannot beat and they've already fallen in death. Where do we find ourselves in our state of sin before Christ? We find ourselves in death, right? According to Ephesians, we are dead in our sins. Now, we're physically alive, right? We have a physical birth, life, then we'll have a physical death. But in our physical birth, we do not find spiritual life right away, right? That spiritual life comes from Jesus Christ. Now, we can go through a lot with this, but the big point is, these adults right here, who Amos is writing to, he's telling them, you think you're alive, you think you're warriors, and you think you're coming to battle, and you think you're okay, but you're not. You are dead. You're fallen. Then he says, this is the virgin of, of, of Israel. So this is another gospel reference and some biblical sarcasm. Quick poll here. Uh, who in here is uh, sarcastic? Let's just, let's, let's see it. Okay. Who in here thinks sarcasm is funny? Okay, that's good. Who in here thinks sarcasm is a means of attack? <laughs> Okay, it's the ones that raise their hands to both of those that are the dangerous ones, right? Because then you don't know what you're getting hit with, right? It's, it's, I don't know if this is funny or not. Are, are, you, are, are we laughing? Okay, 
So there's lots of sarcasm in, uh, in the Bible. You see this in Job. You see this a lot in Amos. Um, but here's some, some sarcasm that we'll get to in just a minute. But we're going to first talk about the fact that this is a gospel reference. So the, who is the bride of Christ? The church, right? This is an allusion to the future bride of Christ, right? So Israel was not the bride. Israel was the nation of, 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 that God chose in the Old Testament to be the picture and the light to the world, the hope of, the, of, of, of God to the world around them, that he would eventually have his son through the lineage of, of, uh, of uh, Moses and Dave, uh, of David and, uh, King, and Abraham, that through this lineage, he would come and bring salvation to the world, right? Creating this new kingdom and the church, which would be his bride. This is an allusion to that. So this church, the bride of Christ, will be presented spotless to Christ when he returns. But it's not because of anything we're going to do, right? Who in here has visited a more than one church in your life? More than two, three, four, five. Okay, awesome. So we got a good sampling here. Um, who knows that there were problems at those churches that you visited? Who knows there are problems at the church that you're currently attending? <laughs> I'm here, so there's problems, right? This is, this is how this works. If God said, if Jesus said, I'm not coming back until you make yourselves spotless as churches, how long would we be on earth? <laughs> Jesus is not coming back, right? It's not going to happen. Jesus makes his bride spotless for himself. That's the only way it worked. That's what's so beautiful about it. It's nothing that we do. It's because he makes us clean. And so this reference to virginity is, is, is about marriage. So what he's saying is inside of marriage, when, you're, when you come to your marriage, you're saying, I'm coming in, I'm bringing virginity with me. You're saying, I'm not bringing sin into my marriage that's going to possibly bring hurt or hardship to my marriage in, uh, in, in, in the future, right? That's what, that's what this is talking to. That's why this was important. But here's the problem. Israel is, is not a, a virgin in the story, right? They're not saying, I'm bringing no sin into this relationship. In fact, they're bringing lots of, lots of sin into the relationship between them and God. In fact, they're being punished severely because what we currently see is they're choosing sin over God repeatedly. And so there is a little sarcasm here of saying like, oh, look at you guys. You're doing so well. You look so spotless. You, yeah, maybe you're doing some religious things, but you are... You are teeming with sin. But here's the beautiful thing. It is Jesus Christ that can give back to us something that we think we lose and can never get back, right? Only Jesus can give new life and new creation. Once you're born, can you make yourself a different person? Can you be born again? Physically, no. I don't have that physical ability. I cannot do that to myself. Once I've been born, that is, that's it. I am the baby born on earth. Only God can say, I can take that and make it new. Who in here likes cars? I know Wesley does. So we like cars. If, uh, if I go and I buy a brand new car and I drive it off the lot, what does that car become? Used. What, what happens immediately? Value drops the moment I drive past the parking lot, right? Can I ever make that car new again? No. I can clean it. I can take care of it. I can do lots of things to it, but I cannot make it new again. Jesus takes something that is used, broken, dead, gone, whatever words you want to use to describe our state and sin, and makes us new again. That is the beautiful thing, is that the way that Israel can, be, can become this, this, this virgin bride is because they get to be a part of the church in the future, but they're looking to the Messiah, the Messiah who can make them new. Take the brokenness that, that is in them, take the sin that is in them, and forgive it and clean it to make them spotless. She's forsaken on her land. In their love of sin, they had no ability to restore themselves. They are helpless in their addiction to sin, and they're in desperate need of a Savior. So Israel's got this land, right? Look, I've got the land. I'm a king. We've got a people, a kingdom. We've even got lots of stuff. And even in all their prosperity, what, God, what Amos says here and what God tells Amos to write is, yeah, but you're forsaken on your land. You might have stuff. You might have things. You might have what you think you need. But it is of no use to you in your, uh, in your state, in your sin. You're forsaken on your land. 
with none to raise her up. So they are dead in their sin, just as we are dead in ours, or were dead in our sins. Let me ask a question. If someone in here were by themselves in this room, and you had a cardiac event and needed CPR, could you perform it on yourself? (laughs) I don't think so. That would be very difficult to do, right? That's not going to work. We need somebody else in that state, right? When we're in this state of of dying or our heart's already stopped, we're in physical death, we need help from someone else who can do that for us. Just in the same way, we can't put spiritual life back into ourselves by any kind of works that we could do. I can't sit here and perform spiritual CPR on me to make myself suddenly start living spiritually. I can do things, and they might look like they're working. They might look really good, but it's not going to give me spiritual life if that's all I'm relying on. Only Jesus can give me spiritual life where I have spiritual death. Only him. And here's the beautiful thing about that. That could be scary if Jesus was like me because I can be very fickle. I can have favorites. I can have people that I want to be mean to. I can have people that I I don't care about like I should, right? Does anybody else struggle with people in the same way? Oh, oh, everybody likes. So if you like all people, raise your hand. Okay, good. Now, that that was was a little easier. Uh, You guys are just tired. Uh, Who in here thinks some people can be annoying? Yeah, okay, good. There you go. We're, We're getting there. You guys are waking up a little bit. Here's the thing. While we can let those things control us, I would struggle to save some people. I would. That would be a struggle for me because my flesh controls a lot of my actions. The beautiful thing about Jesus is he says, no matter how despicable you are, my sacrifice was enough. And I want to save you. That is something none of us could say. No one in this room could love like Jesus loves. That's what's amazing about him is he finds Israel, he finds even us in this state of decay and death due to our own choice to love sin more than him. And even there where he could look at us and say, you caused this uh, to yourself. You You chose this. You can bear the penalty, right? And he would be just in saying so. Instead, he looks at us in our sorry state and says, I love you even now and I'll forgive all your sin. Place your faith in me. What Israel needed was someone who could perform spiritual CPR, giving life where there was death. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which uh, went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So went out a thousand, one hundred left, uh, left over. Only wealthy cities could send out a thousand soldiers. These wealthy cities that relied on their strength were defeated. So many of the tithes, now we can, we, you guys know I have a soapbox with uh, the word tithe and what it was in the Old Testament and all this stuff. But uh, a lot of the tithes, like the single ones, were a 10% offering of something, right? A 10% here. So 10% of this. While these evil people were faithful to give their 10%, because remember they were giving. Every third day, they would come with their tithe. Every third day, they'd bring it in and say, here you go, I'm giving back what I need to give because I am right. I'm doing good things. I'm doing these spiritually, uh, these religious activities that make me good. They are faithful to give their 10%, but because of their sin, God was going to take 90% away from them because their religious acts were fake. They were performing religious acts but they had no spiritual life in them. They were not in pursuit of God. They were, pers- they were in pursuit of themselves and their own appetites. So performing religious activities does not make us right with God. In fact, he hates them when we're just doing them because that's what you should do or because we think we're somehow working our way into his grace even though we're choosing to love our sin even more. Those that went out 100 left, uh, they had 10 left, Only poor cities could only send a hundred soldiers. We may expect God to punish the poor less than the rich, right? 
We may look at this and think, be like, okay, well, if one of the big problems here was the rich were oppressing the poor, wouldn't you think, sure, the, people, the, the rich cities that sent out a thousand soldiers, they should come back with only a hundred. But these poor cities that only sent a hundred soldiers, they should, they should be able to keep more. Like they, They're already struggling more. But these people were in love with their sin in the same way as their rich neighbors. They were, uh, uh, they were committing the same crimes, and so they still also lost 90% of these soldiers. Because here's the thing, God is just. And it doesn't matter if my sin looks like it's bigger than your sin or is more visible than your sin. Guess what we both are outside of Jesus Christ? Sinners, lost and without hope. We love to stigmatize and categorize and look at certain sins and say, that person's the real bad one. But here's the thing, we are forgetting that all sin is a crime punishable by death. All of it. And the only forgiveness we can find is in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if I look like I'm doing better than somebody else. It doesn't matter if I can even convince myself, well, at least you're better than them. So what? As we see here, God's not partial to me being less of a sinner than someone else. If I am loving sin, so again, here I'm speaking as a Christian. If I am loving sin more than I'm loving God, if I'm pursuing stuff more than I'm pursuing the person who created that stuff, there is going to be punishment for that. There is going to be consequences for that. There is going to be discipline for that. And it doesn't matter if I think that my pursuits are not as bad as somebody else's. There's still discipline for this. Because God hates sin. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel and do not enter into Gilgal or cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into exile and Bethel shall come to nothing. This is the gospel written in the Old Testament. I I love this because a lot of times we look for the gospel only in the New Testament, right? That's, That's where we search for it. That's where we see the picture of the Messiah come right? Jesus, but the people of the old covenant, especially the the last part of their time when they had kings, they they knew to be looking for a Messiah. They knew to be looking for God's way of providing mercy and providing forgiveness because they knew that they could not achieve it on on, uh, on their own. Israel could not work hard enough to gain forgiveness for their sins. They needed God to forgive them by grace through faith in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Even if they didn't know at this time who the Messiah would be on earth, right? They didn't know what he would look like, what his name would be. They still had to place their faith in the coming Messiah and the ability of God to provide salvation for sin through grace by faith. That's how God has always saved. So God's saying to these Israelites, and again, up to this point, God has been saying, hey, punishment's coming, get ready. The lion is coming. Me, the God of uh, the host of armies, I'm, I'm coming. Prepare to meet your God. And here we see something beautiful. Even in this terrible state of sin, he says, seek me and live. That's the same answer that he gives us today. Seek Christ and live. You are already dead. Outside of Christ, you're already dead in your sins. You have spiritual death in you. Seek Christ and live. Do not seek Bethel or Gilgal. And I I forgot to add the part on here about crossing over to Beersheba. We'll talk about that in a second. Oh, actually, no, I have it. I have it. We're good. So do not seek Bethel or Gilgal. So remember, Bethel and Gilgal, so you have the southern kingdom of of, uh, Judah. You have the northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem is down here in Judah. So where God commanded all Israelites to worship was in Jerusalem. But the Israelites, being the northern kingdom, they they were separate kingdoms. They had wars, and they, they decided not to be the same nation anymore. They're like, well, we're not going to go down there to worship. That's ridiculous. That's where Judah's nation, that's, where, that's their place. So they decided to, outside of God's law, create their own places of worship because they still need to look religious, right? If we're going to not do what God commanded, we at least need to pretend like we're doing what God commanded. We never do. We, the church doesn't struggle with that today, do we? Not at all. We're not going to do what he says, but we're going to look like we do what he says. That way we can feel good about ourselves. So they created these places in uh, Bethel and in Gilgal where they'd say they, they set up their own structures and places to go. And that this is where we'll have our altars and this is where we'll do our sacrifices. This is where we'll worship God our way because we should do it the way we want to. 
And what God says is, uh, if you're seeking, he says, seek me and live. Don't go to these places. Pursuing a religious act does not save anyone, right? What they were doing there, they were doing religious things. Would most people look at the people of uh, Israel as they are performing these religious activities and say they're good people? Yes, they'd be bringing their, their goods. They'd be bringing their tithes. They'd be bringing their sacrifices. They would come and do religious activities, and most people would look at them and say, look at those good religious people. But God says, don't even go, because that's not what he was after. He's not after their religious activity. He's after their hearts. Do people still rely on religious activity for salvation today? Have you ever asked somebody if they're saved, ask somebody if they're what they believe or if they're a Christian, they're like, oh, well, yes, my, uh, my, my, my grandfather was a pastor, so yeah. Anybody heard that, heard that answer? What they're saying is, I believe because somebody before me was doing religious activities and I kind of continue doing some of those religious activities, of course that means that I believe what they believe and that means I'm, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. That's not what being a Christian is. Can you go to church and not believe in Jesus uh, as your Savior? Can you do religious work and not believe in Jesus as your Savior? Yes. In fact, if you come back tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about this a lot as we talk about what the gospel is and what it's not. But here's the thing. What, what God is saying to these people is the things you've been doing to make yourselves feel spiritual were only for you. You made you feel good by doing, the good, doing all this stuff you were busy, and you were busy doing religious things, but it did not change your heart or your pattern of sin or your appetite. So he tells them not to go to those places, and he says, don't even cross over to Beersheba. So here's the thing. Beersheba was not in Jerusalem, but it was close to it. It was down in the southern kingdom of Judah. And you have some people obviously considering, like, okay, If God, you know, he's obviously not happy with us creating our own places of worship that he didn't command us to create, where we're trying to to do our religious activities in a place that he told, that he didn't tell us to do it in. So let's go close to Jerusalem. Like, we won't actually go where we're supposed to go. We'll we'll go close. We'll go to Beersheba. It's about 25 miles away. That's close enough. God will will like that just enough, right? Like, if, if I do close to what he tells me to, that will mean I'm good. How often do we not struggle with that, Right? Let me do something a little better. All right, I, I, don't, I don't want to stop doing what I know I should stop doing, but I'll start doing this one thing that's a little more like what God wanted me to. I'll do a little bit more than I have been doing because then I don't have to feel so guilty about the other stuff. But here's the thing, especially when it comes to salvation, there's no amount of work you can do to obtain salvation by yourself. Only faith in Jesus can forgive you of your sins. That's it. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and it devour, with none, with none to quench it for Bethel. O oh, you who turn justice to wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. There are times in the Bible where the fire of God is good for people. Right? In fact, we, we have lots of songs that talk about the fire of the Lord, right? And we, we, we think about it, oh, that, that, that's, that's good, it's good. You, I can think in the Old Testament of the pillar of fire by night that would lead them where they needed to go, right? That was a good thing. That was a very good fire. You think about the burning bush where Moses got to meet and hear from God. I think about in Acts when the Holy Spirit uh, is given to the disciples, right? In the upper room where it descends, what does it look like? Flaming tongues that come down and lands on them. That, that's all good fire that we've seen in the Bible, but here his fire is being warned as destruction. And just like these Israelites, we will face the destruction of God's fire unless we place our faith in Jesus for forgiveness of our sins. His fire, it, it, it's, it's, it's not something that is what we, would, what we would look at as just good or bad. It's always good, but sometimes it's going to bring destruction, Right? His fire is is a fire of of wrath against sin. God hates it. And yet he loves you. 
That is the biggest paradox and most beautiful thing in the world because I wouldn't love you, right? Outside of this, like none of us would love the way God does with a love before someone ever changes a single thing about themselves, living in complete animosity towards God. God looks at that person and says, I love you. We wouldn't do that. God's so much better. And he says, I love you enough to forgive you this, of the very sin that my wrath burns against. And devour it with none to quench it. Just like God's warning to the Israelites, the penalty of sin is eternal death. And here's the thing. Who in here has the ability to save someone else from hell? None of us. I wish I could. But that's not what I have the ability to do. I have no ability to save someone from hell. Only Jesus Christ can. You who turn justice to wormwood... I had to, to study this one a little bit. So wormwood was an herb that they used in, in mainly medicines, but um, it had a very, very bitter, terrible taste. So this form of justice was so perverted that God compares it to a disgusting flavor in his mouth. What he's saying is, you know how to treat people right. You know when you're being selfish. You know when you're uh, mistreating others around you. You know when people are suffering because of your choices. You know when it's happening. And yet you're choosing to do it anyways, and it's disgusting to me. That's how God feels about the way we treat each other. Is there still injustice in our world today? Is God still disgusted by it? Yes. Is there injustice in our churches today? Is God even more disgusted by that? Yes. Look at the amount that he's writing Israel compared to what he wrote to the other nations. He was disgusted by their sin. But the people of Israel were called to be different and had access to information to know what it looked like to be different. So they're judged harsher. We as the church cannot allow injustice to run rampant. We have to resist the temptation to pervert justice in our pursuit of our own appetites. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day, the day and the night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out onto the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong, so that the destruction comes upon the fortress. So the Pleiades is part of the constellation Taurus. God, and he made uh, Orion as well. So God created all the stars in the universe to declare his glory. And yet here's Israel struggling with idolatrous worship of stars. They're worshiping something that was made by God. Can you imagine if we came in here and started worshiping a chair because it was so amazing to sit in? That'd be silly, right? We'd be like, somebody just made that. Like, that obviously, like, nothing miraculous happened to this chair. Somebody made it. If you like it so much, you should actually go and thank the person who created it. Like, go and write them a letter. That's what it's like to worship something created because we have to think, okay, God made that. Why would I worship stars or a, a, a figure made by man or the wind or sun or anything else when I can know all of those things are created things made by God? But the thing is, we, maybe we don't worship in that way, but do we still make more of creation than we do to our creator? Sure we do. We struggle with that all the time. Pursuing stuff over the very being that created all matter. He turns day to night, night uh, he turns night to day and day to night. God has total control of all of his creation. Why would we worship anything less? He causes the rivers to flow, right? He says there's the seas. He makes the water move around the earth. So everything on earth operates in the way that God commands it. So we have fresh water to drink. Today, because God designed the earth in a way that it follows his rules. And then he destroys the strong. Who can stand against an enemy like the one who created the stars, controls the forces of the universe, and provides everything for life to exist? Who can stand against that enemy? No one. So what hope do we have? 
We have sinned in the very same manner as the Israelites. We have chased what God created far more than we have chased him. We are dead in our sin with no power to raise raise ourselves up. We only have hope in Jesus who will give us eternal life the moment that we believe in him to forgive us of our sins. So we bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I have just a few questions. The first one is this. Have you been chasing God's creation more than you've been chasing him? If so, will you take time to confess that and repent of it today? Have you been practicing empty religion while guarding sin in your life? Have you been doing things to make yourself feel better while secretly hiding sin that you know is causing destruction? Will you confess that and ask for forgiveness today? And the most important question, have you put your faith in Jesus, who is our only hope for salvation from our sin? Jesus, I pray you call us to you right now. Draw us to you. Reveal yourself to us. Lord, if there's anybody in here who hasn't believed in you yet, hasn't placed their faith in you for forgiveness of their sins, Lord, I pray that you would draw them to you right now. Let them see that you truly are offering the free gift of salvation. Lord, there's nothing we bring to the table other than belief, other than faith, that you are exactly who you said you are and you did exactly what you said you did. Help anyone in here who hasn't yet believe in you. God, forgive us for where we've chased things over you. Forgive us for where we've practiced empty religion while guarding sin in our lives. And Lord, let us live a life where we have earned opportunities to share your gospel with others. In your name I pray, amen. Please stand and respond however God leads you. Thank you.